This week's GCN Racing News Show, Remco Avenepoel goes back to back at Liège Baston Liège on the same day that Demi Vollering completes the Ardennes Triple. I'll be looking at how both races have won, as well as recapping the Tour of the Alps and La Flèche Wallonne, and letting you know about all the racing we've got coming up for you on GCN Plus this week. <laughs> This week in the world of racing, we learnt that white shorts are back. Much to the delight of Adam Blythe, Remco Avenepoel rocked up to Liège Baston Liège in a full white skin suit, aside from the rainbow colours, of course. It just looks good, doesn't it? I mean, look how good it stands out now. He's the world champion. He should stand out and just look absolutely brilliant, and he does. Uh, let me know your thoughts on that fashion decision in the comments section down below. We also learnt that we have a new Queen of the Ardennes. Demi Vollering's win at Liège Baston Liège yesterday completed her triple with Amstel and Flesch before it, a feat only ever accomplished by Van der Breggen, Gilbert, and Rebelin. And finally, we learnt what it takes to ride up the Côte de la Redoute near the front of the men's Liège Baston Liège. Ben Healy's Strava file there reveals that he averaged 456 watts for 4 minutes and 23 seconds at a weight of 65 kilograms, and he was still 11 seconds slower than Avonapool up that climb on the day. From that climb, though, the result was pretty much inevitable. With Pogacar crashing out in the first 100Ks of the race, there was nobody left in the race that would compete with the world champion who cruised to his second victory from two participations at the race. Let's have a look at how he did it. Live coverage started with 134 kilometers to go in the men's race. By this point, we've all learned about the news that Pogacar is out of the race through a crash. And of course, everyone within the peloton knows that as well. And so the responsibility to control the early breakaway falls on the shoulders of Sudal Quickstep and the defending champion Remco Avenepoel. And they don't let them off the leash very much. Three minutes and 59 seconds the time gap, and they're not even halfway through this race. If we go on a little bit further, we'll see the first key attack of the race. Jan Trapnik of Jumbo Visma, he's been at altitude with Primoz Roglic and you'll join him again for the Giro d'Italia, but we start to get a sense of just how well he's already going. Valentin Madwas uh, trying to follow him, Magnus Sheffield from Ineos Grenadiers as well, but they really struggle to get up to his wheel, and in fact, he almost has to wait for them to get there. Uh, a little bit further on, and Madwas is distanced from the lead group. Uh, but what I found interesting about this part of the race was how early they had started to use the former world champion, Julian Alain. Philippe. At this point, just four riders in total from Sudal Quickstep, so three to help the world champion. And given the quality of Ala Philippe, I was just a little bit surprised that they used him so early. Uh, this is the point that Tratnik goes solo in pursuit of the early breakaway because even Magnus Sheffield can't keep up with the power of the Slovenian at this point. Uh, we go a little bit further in this clip. I wanted to highlight the positioning of this man from EF, Ben Healy. A couple of weeks ago, I don't think he would have had the confidence to place himself here amongst such brilliant riders. And I also don't think that they would have let him in. Without those results at Brabant's Appeal and Amstel Gold, he just wouldn't have earned the respect. And it becomes much more hard to hold your position within the bunch if you don't have those results. The next point I want to highlight was the catch. Uh, made by Tratnik to the early days breakaway, it's 20 kilometers after his initial move from the main peloton. So he's closed a large gap and he's now got one minute and six seconds over this group behind. But I think this really highlights just here how much they were pressing on at Sudal Quickstep. Three of their riders at the front, Tom Pidcock glued to their wheel, but a gap opening up to Mohoric and more gaps opening up behind. They were not hanging about in the second half of the race yesterday. All right, the next clip then is this one. Good attack here, I would say, from Balkan Mollema because Sudal Quickstep at this point in the race with 47 kilometers to go only have Vavarka and Van Wilder left to do the work. And if you keep your eye on Vavarka here, he's done so much work that he starts to get distanced and moves back down the group. And that means that Avonapool just has one rider left to control the race with still that 47 kilometers remaining. The Balkan Mollema attack doesn't come to anything, but I think this is where a lot of the teams missed a trick. Just Van Wilder on the front, 
one, two, three, four riders from the Ineos Grenadiers who could potentially go on the attack. One, two, three from Trek Segafredo. Now, of course, Sudal Quickstep want to slow this down so that Favaka can get back to the front and help them uh, to keep everything together on the way into Laradouk, which is where Avonapol wants to go on the attack. You can see him on the radio there, just checking where his teammate is, and the answer is there. They slowed it down enough that Vavaka could get back on, and there were barely any attacks in that period of time. Pelo Bilbao tried, but that came to nothing either. Next clips are over on this side. This is Laradou. Just keep your eye on the back wheel here of Remco Evenepoel. Van Wilde has done an incredible job all the way up the climb, but just as he tries to go, his rear wheel slips on that acceleration on that painted face on the road. So he sort of second guesses himself and doesn't go until a little bit later on. Over the top though, he does create a gap and it looks like a large one all the way back to Tom Pidcock of Ineos Grenadiers here. Now the actual duration of this gap is not as big as it looks on the screen here because they're going downhill, but the descending skills of Tom Pidcock around these wet corners allows him to get back onto the world champion. Uh, this is the point at which the junction is made, but if I go on to the next clip, you'll see Avonapol flick his elbow and a really stern shake of the head of Tom Pidcock there. He's already realized just how strong Avonapol is on the day, and later he gets dropped and distanced. Now in the post-race interview, he explains to us that he had a choice, either blow himself up trying to stay on the wheel of Avonapol, or maybe sit up for the group behind and try to salvage second place from there, which is exactly what he did. A bit further on, we see the best of the rest coming to the fore. So three riders, Ben Healy, Santiago Butrago, and Pidcock, who's recovered enough to get onto their wheel. But I think the team that's most disappointed at this point in the race, and with the ultimate outcome, is Trek Segafredo. Skilmosa and Ciccone looked great on the day, but they missed this final move. Uh, this is the final clip. And just to highlight the dominance, really, of Remco Evenepoel. One minute and 30 seconds to the next riders on the road. I think that gap could have been two minutes by the line if he'd continued to press on. But at this point, he knew he didn't need to take any risks on the corners. He knew he didn't even need to press on full gas all the way to the line. So the gap in the end, just over one minute. But Evenepoel in a class of his own. Uh, Pidcock took second place in the sprint from Butrago. And here's what the Brit had to say post-race. I'm, I'm, I'm bloody freezing. <laughs> um, no, no, to, no. I mean, uh, of course, you know, my ambition is to to win, and I I want to win. But um, yeah, Remco is incredibly strong today, and yeah, my first podium in a monument. So I I, I can be happy with this. On to the women's race, and once again, we learned a lot about what was happening through social media and the live ticker. Uh, live coverage started with 46 kilometers to go, and at that point, we'd had a very strong group out the front. Rursa, Spratt, Pepperkamp, and Anna Henderson. One rider, however, was missing from this quintet. There were five up the road, and we soon found out the reason why through this following replay. Kasia Nubiodoma of Canyon Sram had punctured out of this group. Really, really unfortunate for that team. And because the gap was only 30 seconds, she had to get a wheel from neutral service. And by the time it was replaced, she was pretty much caught by the peloton behind. And that completely changed the dynamics of this race. Because we look at this aerial shot, it's Canyon Sram all of a sudden having to do the chasing behind that lead group. Trek Segafredo don't need to, SD Works don't need to. I really felt sorry for that team at this point in the race because they'd looked in such a good position. I go on to the next clip, we start to get a sense of how well Marlon Rursa is going. Because before this, I was thinking to myself, well, SD Works, they're in a decent position. They've got one rider in this quintet up the road, but maybe she'll get dropped by Amanda Spratt, who on paper is a superior climber. But if I run this clip on, you will start to see that Rursa distances Anna Henderson at the foot of the Côte de la Redoute. And a little bit further up, as we get towards the steeper slopes towards the top, we see that even Amanda Spratt is unable to hang on to Marlon Rosa, who is flying out front. She's going so well, she increases the gap over the group of main favourites over the course of the Cote de la Dute. In that group of main favourites, as you would expect, world champion Annemiek van Fleurten is on the attack. The problem that she's got is that there are two very strong SD Works riders within this group. This is the race favourite Demi Vollering. Two places behind her, Neve Fisher Black. And at this point in the race, because they've got a sol solo leader out front in Marlon Rursa, of course they're not going to aid the chase at all. 
Now, one point that I wanted to make about Trek Segafredo's tactics, generally very good on the day, but I felt like Amanda Spratt should have been called back a little bit earlier. She's never going to close that 46 seconds to one of the best time trialists in the world, and she's not aiding the chase for Trek Segafredo behind. Really dangerous situation. A minute and a half is Ruiz's lead over the main favourites behind. As I said, one of the best time trials in the bunch. At that point, I felt like she might be taking the win in Liège, Baston Liège. Uh, over to this next clip then. Finally, Spratt is brought back and to give her and the team their dues, they did a brilliant job at chasing Ruiza down. It's a minute and four seconds at this point. A little bit later on, it's down to 39 seconds and we'll start to see just how fierce their chase is. Not only have they brought the gap down to the leader, they've opened up a gap to some of the main favourites behind. Only Elise Shabby of Canyon SRAM is on their coattails. And I think that this is a dangerous position for SD Works because Vollering and Nee Fisher Black are caught behind and they end up having to do a little bit of the chasing of this group. You can see them on the front in just a few moments time having to do the chasing behind three riders from Trek Segafredo. Now this is another dangerous point in, for SD Works. Uh, at this point in the race, Marlon Russo has been caught, but she's on the attack again. And who's following her? We've got Elisa Longo Borghini. Keep your eye out for Demi Vollering though. She decides, well, I've got a teammate going up the road. I don't need to do the chasing. And so she sits up. But the reason this is dangerous is because of how much work Marlon Rosa has already done in this race. Is she gonna beat Elisa Longo Borghini and take the win? That's a big risk to take. But you can see how much the speed has come out of the chase because we've even got Marcus, the Dutch champion, coming back from Jumbo Visma. Uh, Annemiek van Fleurten once again does her best to get back on terms, but in the end, Demi Vollering just takes things into her own hands. She can kind of afford to do this, really, with the form that she's showing at the moment. She bridges up to her teammate and to Elisa Longo Borghini and then rides on the front, and it's down to just two riders for the sprint finish at the end. This is that sprint finish. One and a half kilometres to go. They've got just under a half a minute gap. I was wondering whether Longo Borghini was going to start sitting on at this point and gambling, a bit like she did in Amstel Gold with Cash and Nubia Doma just a few years ago. She doesn't know. She leaves it as late as possible to start her sprint. And her sprint has got better over the last year or so. But you'll see in just a few moments time when she does go volering is every bit her equal and managed to get past her before they get to the finish line. The triple completed for Demi Vollering in fine style and a great tactical masterclass there from SD Works for the most part. Uh, here's Vollering's interview from after the race. I'm so good race, La Flèche in now Liège. What's the feeling? You made history again. Oh, it's amazing. I cannot believe it. Um, I'm so grateful for my teammates and super proud. Uh, tell us about um, this last Kilos Meters. It was really a game with Elisa Longo Borghini. Um, tell us about this final. Yes, um, I was really happy that Elisa wanted to work with me. And uh, yeah, then in the last K, uh, we really needed to gamble. And uh, yeah, I knew I could gamble because I also had Marlon behind me, of course. So um, that made it a bit easier for me. But um, yeah. I'm just really happy that I could win the sprint and take it home. What a season it's been for Demi Vollering so far in 2023. Seven race days, never lower than second. And her results in those seven races, first, 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 second, second, first, first. Not too shabby, is it? For Bogatcha, it wasn't a fairy tale ending, but it was still a fairy tale spring. Here's an injury update from the team's general manager, Mauro Gianetti. Not so good news. I have a multiple fracture to the left wrist and also a fracture on the, on the loon bone that he will not need the surgery, That's the second one. He will be operated right now directly in the hospital of Genk by a hand specialist. Since it's not just one bone broken but multiple, it will be a little bit more complicated the, the, the operation. So cross finger will be all okay and he will, he will be able to recover very fast. It has since been reported that the injuries he sustained yesterday at Liège are severe enough that it could disrupt his plans to go up to altitude in May. He is hoping, though, that he's back to his best by July for the Tour de France. On now to what we've got coming up for you on GCN Plus this week. And starting tomorrow, it's the Tour de Romandie. 
an historical race that started all the way back in 1947. For many years, it served as a final preparation race for the Giro d'Italia. That's not really the case now, but that doesn't mean it's lost any of its prestige. Amongst those on the start list are the Yates twins, Igita, Bardet, Mainkies, Pino, Vorkala, Jorgensen, Rodriguez, Maida, and Lutsenko. Amongst those that are combining this race with the Giro d'Italia this year are Mark Cavendish, Fernando Gaviria, Magnus Court, and the aforementioned Thibaut Pino. There are also rumours that the race will mark the season start for Juan Ayuso, who's been sidelined due to tendonitis so far this year. It kicks off with a seven kilometre prologue around Port Valais. Two possible sprint stages follow, but the sprinters will have to work hard for them. And then there's a second individual time trial test, this time on a hilly 19 kilometre circuit on stage three. The only summit finish comes the day after that to tie on 2000, and at over 20 kilometers in length, it should see some big time gaps. The race is available to watch on GCN Plus if you're in Europe, the US, Canada, or the Asia Pacific, excluding China and New Zealand. Check the app for timings of each stage. Uh, we have two races for you this Sunday, the first of which is Eschborn Frankfurt, which is typically a sprinter's race. Some territory restrictions apply, and the second is the first stage of the Vuelta Femenina, the first of the big three stage races for the women's peloton this season. It's extended this year to seven days in length, and you'll be able to watch that if you're in Europe or the Asia Pacific, excluding China, Japan, and New Zealand. It's also now just 11 days until the Giro d'Italia kicks off, the first three-week race of the year and one that is available in all GCN Plus territories, including New Zealand. It will be upon us before we know it. On the World of Cycling this Wednesday, I'm going to be joined by Nico Roach and Max Stedman to chat about the Giro d'Italia and the races just completed, whilst our documentary this week centres around Vincenzo Nibali. And when I say it centres around him, we followed him throughout his final season as a pro rider, from pre-season training to the Arden Classics, the Giro d'Italia, Vuelta a España and Il Lombardia. But it's more than just about 2022. This documentary chronicles the cycling life of the Shark of Messina, looking back on the highs and lows of what was an incredible career. Now, I've not actually seen the film myself yet, but if the trailer is anything to go by, you do not want to miss it. Ho imparato ad andare in bici molto presto, eh, però non ho mai fatto gare. No, noi siamo iniziati piano piano, gradualmente, giocarellando. Oggi abbiamo Vincenzo Nibali. È difficile poter far capire a tutti quanti, a tutte le persone, la vita come viene vissuta da noi e anche il dietro le quinte. Más larga era la etapa y más dura, más fuerte era. La característica única que ha Vincenzo es el feeling con la bicicleta. Vincenzo Nibali è stato capace di entrare nella storia. Quell'anno diciamo che Vincenzo si è fatto conoscere anche da appassionati di sport, non solo di ciclismo. Full documentary is going to be available to watch on GCN Plus for tomorrow for all subscribers. Just before I move on, I also wanted to point out that the best way to receive the latest news and exclusive offers from GCN direct to your inbox, including weekly alerts and previews of the biggest races coming up on GCN Plus, is to sign up to the newsletter. You'll also get exclusive GCN subscriber-only offers, competitions and shop bundles, plus early access to GCN sales. And if you sign up before Friday the 19th of May, you'll be entered into a competition to win the ultimate GCN racing bundle containing a GCN Plus subscription, three t-shirts, the complete fan's guide to pro cycling, coffee and a mug. Uh, five runner-up prizes are also available, so if you like the sound of that, just visit gcn.eu forward slash GCN newsletter and sign up. And don't worry if you're already a subscriber, we'll be including instructions on how to enter in this week's newsletter, so keep your eyes peeled for that. On to the rest of last week's racing now, and I'll start with La Flèche Wallonne, where there were some great team tactics from Trek Segafredo in the women's race. After Annemiek van Fleurten pulled a group clear on the penultimate ascent of the Mur de Ouy, they realised that Vollering was not only isolated, but had had to do much of the chasing herself. Shirin van Androoy immediately made a move, and once caught, Amanda Spratt was the next to go on the offensive. 
And she was a bit unlucky that she didn't have anybody for company, but she still pulled out a decent advantage and it meant that all of her teammates behind could sit on the wheels and save energy. Unfortunately for them, there was nothing that anyone was going to be able to do against Demi Vollering on the day. The SD Works rider slimmed the group down on the penultimate climb of the day. And although some riders came back for the Murder Wee, the result was already inevitable. Sat down for most of the climb, Vollering almost smiled when she got out of the saddle and looked around to see nobody on her wheel. She is in the form of her life right now. Second on the day was Liana Lippert with Gaia Riolini in third. A uh, shout out though to Ashley Mormon Passio, who took her 10th top 10 at the race last Wednesday with a sixth place on the day. In the men's, we were wondering if Pogaccia might light things up early on the day. But the answer was no. He did what most of the successful riders in this race have done for the past couple of decades and sat in until the final couple of hundred meters. Like Vollering earlier on in the day, it was hard to see anybody else getting a look in when he went. He had time to post up before the line before taking his 11th win of the season so far. A brilliant ride from Skelmos of Trek saw him finish runner up with Lander in third. So how did Pogaccia's time up the murder week compared to the others over the last few years? Well, we got the answer to that from Amati Purili on Twitter. Pogaccia's ascent took two minutes and 46 seconds, which was the same duration taken by Dylan Turns last year and a second faster than he or she in 2020. However, it was five seconds slower than the current record, which is held by Alaphilippe and Valverde in 2021 and 2014 respectively. And in winning there on Wednesday, Pogaccia became the first rider in history to win Flanders, Amstel and Flesch in the very same season. Meanwhile, there was some good old fashioned Ineos Grenadiers domination at the Tour of the Alps during the week. A strong attack from Hugh Carthy at the end of stage one was caught and passed by a flying Theo Gegenhardt, who backed that up with a second stage win just the following day. And at that point in the race, Gegenhardt had ridden seven stages of the Tour of the Alps in his career and won four of them. Not a bad record. They didn't have things all their own way though. Some great tactics from Bora Hansgrohe on stage three worked out well for them with Leonard Kemner taking the win there. Whilst the final two stages were won from the breakaway, an increasingly rare sight in men's racing these days. Gregory Mulberger was one of four Movistar riders in that breakaway on stage four and managed to win the sprint from three riders to the line. Three shout outs for that stage though. Second place Torsten Tryon missed much of last season after recovering from testicular cancer, which he'd found out about through an anti-doping test at that very race last year. It would have been very apt if he'd managed to take his first pro victory there one year later, wouldn't it? A great scene back though, and at the front of races once again. Third place on the day went to 19-year-old Giulio Pellizzari. He was the strongest of everyone on the final climb of the day, so watch out for him. Clearly a very big talent. And the third shout out goes to Mulberger himself, not just for the win, but for such a gracious post-race interview. Thank you, thank you very much. Yes, uh, a, lot of, a lot of time passed since the last win and uh, yeah, I'm super happy, super grateful, especially with this team. It, it was amazing to ride. We, we were four guys in the breakaway and uh, yeah, I mean, at the last, uh, the last climb, I tried my best to keep, keep up with the guys. Um, Chapeau to the young to the young rocket from Bariani. I mean, this is a, a super gun, especially for the future. That will uh, he has he has some some great time ahead. Um, yeah, now I'm I'm happy, super happy with the win, and yeah, thanks thanks to the team. I mean, it was great. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you. What a lovely bloke. Nice to see him take his first win as well in two years, and his first win since he joined Team Movistar. The fifth and final stage was won by EF Simon Carr, who'd been in the breakaway more often than not over the five days. He broke clear at the foot of the final climb, never to be seen again, and it was a 1-2 for the team, with Georg Steinhauser taking second on the day. The overall victory, though, went to Gagan Hart, his first GC win since the Giro d'Italia in 2020. He'll be back on our screens at this year's Giro d'Italia in just a few days' time. Our consistent riding throughout the week rewarded Hugh Carthy with second and Jack Haig with third. In other news, the latest riders joined the mass exodus of the Zaf team is Marae Meiring, whose new home is Team Mobistar. The Zaf have been widely reported as not paying their riders this year, and so it was a surprise to many to see them allowed to race Paris-Roubaix and La Flèche Wallon, having received a wildcard entry into each. At the same time, I think it's actually quite good that the riders still left in that team are still in a shop window, as you'd imagine that they're all now looking for a new job and a new team. And finally, Jonas Vinegar has extended his contract with Jumbo Visma, which will see him remain at the team until at least the end of 2027. 
That's all for the Racing News Show for this week, but I'll be back on Wednesday for the World of Cycling. See you then.